The good news comes to us today from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Hear the word of God. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head, the other at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I've not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. By your grace and through your mercy, we pray, O God, that you will allow these words to come to point to the word just read and to the word made flesh in Jesus the Christ, where we pray this in his name. Amen. Some of you remember the story of the man who had come to the end of his rope and couldn't see anything good left in the world, so he walked out into the middle of the Brooklyn Bridge and climbed up onto the parapet and was about to leap into the East River when a policeman laid an arresting hand on him and drew him back. The man protested to the policeman, you don't understand how miserable my life is, how hopeless the world is. Please just let me jump. The kind-hearted officer tried to talk sense into the man and finally said, well, I have a proposition for you. You take five minutes and give your reasons for why life is not worth living, and I'll take five minutes and give my reasons for why I think life is worth living both for you and for me, And and if at the end of 10 minutes you still feel like jumping, I won't stop you. The man agreed and proceeded to take his five minutes to explain why life was not worth living. And then the officer took his five minutes to explain why life was worth living for the both of them. And at the end of the 10 minutes, the two men joined hands and jumped off the bridge. (laughs) It may not take a whole lot of convincing to get us to believe that the world is going to hell. All it takes is to turn on our computer and start clicking and some algorithm in the sky will lead us down some wormhole of bad news. All it takes is for us to get into that feedback loop of our own clique, our own crowd, our own club, and pretty soon the world's going to hell. And pretty soon we're up on the bridge, and no one seems to have the right argument, the convincing case, the redemptive words. We hunger, don't we, for a good word, a hopeful word, a redemptive word. Like the guy who went to the diner and the waitress came up and asked for his order, I'll take a couple of eggs and a few kind words, the man said. Waitress walked away, 10 minutes later came back, put the two eggs in front of the man. Hey, where are my few kind words, the man asked. She said, don't eat the eggs. (laughs) 
We hunger for a good word, a hopeful word, a redemptive word. Lord knows that's what the Jesus crowd was looking for. The world was most certainly falling apart for them. Their little band had followed the rabbi over hill and dale. They had listened to his teaching. They had seen him perform miracles and signs. They had watched him heal the sick and raise the dead. They had seen that great parade just the week before. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, they were riding high. But then it all seemed to fall apart. The crest of the wave had crashed to the shore. And now there was a betrayal and a denial and arrest and a mock trial and a conviction and a sentencing and a capital punishment and a cold stone sealed tomb. Bad news all around. They didn't have to Google it. It had come to them. And that's where Easter begins, right? It begins with the bad news. It's how John begins his Easter story, right? When it was still dark. When it was still dark. When it was hopeless. When it was still bad news. When it was still dark. Mary went to the tomb. When it was still dark, Mary went to the epicenter of the darkness, the God-forsaken place, the vortex of bad news. John doesn't tell us why she went. She just went to what seemed to be the black hole of the universe. And there she found what she didn't expect to find. She found things not as she expected them to be. She found a mystery. She found a stone rolled away. She found an empty tomb. She found grave clothes pressed to the side. She found a strange man. She found this man who looked like the gardener, but this gardener knows her name. She's found an empty tomb and now a man who knows her name. And then it all comes together. And then it's Rabboni, teacher. Rabboni, teacher. In the darkness, in the mystery, now Mary has a word. She's got a word. She's got a few kind words. I have seen the Lord. She's got the word that splits the night, that shines the light, the word that dispels the bad news, the word that brings hope. I have seen the Lord. Isn't it interesting that of all the people to whom Jesus would appear, it would not be Peter, it would not be John, it would not be James. The first person to whom Jesus would appear would be this woman from whom demons had been cast, this woman like all women, to whom the first century had not given voice. It's Jesus who gives her the word. She becomes the first preacher of the Christian church. I have seen the Lord. To her have been given the few kind words. These are the words that change history. These are the words that bring light to darkness. And if they can be Mary's words, they can be our words because Jesus appears to the least likely of candidates and in the most mysterious of ways. Most of us have had our God moments, right? We've had our God moments. Mary is here to say that if it can happen to me, yes, it can happen to you. Maybe you remember about the woman born 100 years or so ago, a child prodigy, attended Hunter College in New York City at the age of 14, shared a prestigious poetry prize at the age of 23 with none other than Robert Frost. For a time, reveled in her associations with the Communist Party, took pride in her adamant atheism, but then life began to fall apart. Her husband had deserted her, left her alone to care for her two young boys. They had no income. She was at wit's end. The darkness had descended. She was in the black hole. All my defenses, she wrote later, all my defenses, the walls of arrogance and cocksureness and self-love behind which I had hid from God went down momentarily, and God came in. That night, she said, there was a person with me in the room directly present to my consciousness, a person so real that all my previous life was by comparison mere shadow play, and I myself was more alive than I had ever been. It was like walking, waking from sleep. I think I must have been the world's most astonished atheist. And to her had been given a word, I have seen the Lord. This woman named Joy, who later married an old Oxford Don named C.S. Lewis, 
you never know what you might find in the darkness. Because a lot of us have had those mysterious God moments, right? When we have seen the Lord, and they're all different, right? Christ appears in a different, thousand different ways, in bad times and in good times, in sunsets and baby births, in friendship and grief, in the loss of a job, and the finding of a calling, in crippling depression, in unmerited grace, in unconditional love, in those chance meetings that don't feel like chance meetings. Christ appears in a thousand different ways. Andrea Yeager was the youngest woman's tennis player to be seated at Wimbledon. She had risen up the ranks of professional tennis long before she made it halfway through her teenage years, and with her rise came the loss of any semblance of childhood and family. Her dad was overbearing and abusive. Her friends, well, actually, she had no friends. Instead, was forced into pressure and competition that would cripple the strongest of adults. Before she left her teenage years, she had grown bitter, disillusioned, injured, and in the end, burned out. But it was toward the end of the tour, between the end of her, her career, when she was still on tour and visiting various cities, she started visiting pediatric wards of each of those cities. And there amidst the darkness of children hurting and dying, she found her calling. And in her calling, she found, she found the risen Christ. And in the risen Christ, she had been given a word. So she quit tennis, took all her tennis winnings, started a foundation and camp for children with cancer. And she became an Episcopal nun and has given every day of her life since leaving tennis to be with children and to give them a little joy, a little light, in the midst of their dark and scary lives. I have seen the Lord. You never know what you might find in the darkness. Some of you remember the visit we received a few years ago from Kim Fook, the napalm girl, who during the darkness of the Vietnam War ran out of her napalm village and onto the front pages of American newspapers having been burned to within an inch of her life during an American airstrike. In her journey from that darkness, she found the risen Christ and by God's grace feels compelled now to forgive her enemies. She appeared before the Vietnam War Memorial and spoke to the nation a message of forgiveness and reconciliation. And later that day, she met with and forgave, forgave the American serviceman who had mistakenly called in that strike and destroyed her village. And to that despondent veteran, she said, I have seen the Lord. No more guilt for you, no more shame. All is forgiven. You never know what you'll find in the darkness. While it was still dark, John says, which is John's way of saying that this is a story about you and me because we all have our darknesses, we all have our fears, we all don't know where the world is going and we all might be overwhelmed by the bad news and we all might think there is just no good reason to believe that it's gonna get any better. But then out of the shadows walks the man, the resurrected man, no longer the crucified man, the resurrected man. No longer bad news, now good news. No longer guilt and shame and despair because we have seen the Lord. We have the good word, the hopeful word, the redemptive word. You remember Tony Melendez years ago when the Pope visited the United States, he was the young man who was asked to play guitar for the Pope in one of his public masses? Well, nothing big about playing guitar, except that Tony has no arms. He plays guitar with his feet, and if you ask Tony how he does it, he'll tell you it's the risen Christ who redeemed his view of what he could and could not do. Tony tells of after playing for the Pope, how the Pope spontaneously came and gave him a big bear hug, and how amazing it was because just a few years before, a priest, he wanted to become a priest, and they told him he couldn't because no priest has no arms. Jesus had bigger plans. Tony also tells of when his little performance was over, he was walking backstage out of the corner of his eye, he noticed a young girl who was badly deformed, her arms and legs twisted severely, sitting in a wheelchair. Tony saw her attempt to wave to him, and he walked up to her, and with a big smile and tears in her eyes, the little girl said to Tony, because of you, we have hope. Because of you, Tony, we have hope. You have the word, Tony. You have the word. Give us the word, Tony. 
And isn't that what the sad old world needs? The sad old world needs a word. The word made flesh, the word crucified, the word risen. It's not going to cut it if all we have to do is to wallow in the bad news. If all we have is a bad word, if all we got to say is the world's going to hell. Jesus didn't die and rise so we can say the sky's falling. Jesus didn't walk out of that tomb so we can hide in our homes. Jesus doesn't call our name so we forget his. I've seen the Lord, said that young Jewish woman, and the world changed. You know the old joke, what do you get when you cross a Jehovah's Witness with a Presbyterian? You get a guy on your doorstep who doesn't know what to say. (laughs) But Easter changes that, right? We know now what to say. I have seen the Lord. We will go, and we will go to wherever there is darkness. We will go to wherever there is bad news. We will go to wherever there is doubt and guilt and shame and despair. And we will go to our cliques and we will go to our clubs and we will go to our crowds and we will go to wherever there is injustice and poverty. And we will follow that young Jewish woman even into the black hole of a cemetery because she's got the word and so do we. The word of hope and good news, the word of life and new beginnings, the word that changes history, your history, my history, the world's history. Because of you and you and you, the world has hope because we, because we, because we have seen the Lord.